And everybody said, Amen. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for our leadership development uh, meeting today. We're asking, Lord, that you reach our lives with your word. We pray, Lord, this word will penetrate our hearts. And we're going to live by it in Jesus' name. Help us will not be hearers only, readers only, teachers only, preachers only. We'll be doers of the word in Jesus' name. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. As you have heard in the announcement, we're having a special Sunday Scripture study this coming Sunday and it's lesson 810 Solomon builds the temple we're coming to the message of today in 1st Kings chapter 5 verse 5 1st Kings chapter 5 verse 5 and behold I purpose to build a house Unto the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom thou, whom I will set upon thy throne, in thy room, he shall build an house unto my name. Chapter 6, looking at verse 7. And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone made ready before it was brought thither so that there was neither armor nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building verse 11 in verse 11 it says and the word of the Lord came unto Solomon saying Concerning this house, with our art in building, if thou wilt walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then will I perform my word with thee, which I speak unto David thy father. And in verse 13 it says, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Verse 38, the last verse of chapter 6. And in the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, was the house finished throughout all the parts thereof, and according to all the fashion of it. So, he, so was he seven years in building it. I read those passages to you, uh, which is contained in the Sunday scripture we are going to study on Sunday, for you to understand how Solomon built the temple. You will see that he put everything that needed uh, to be put in there for the building of the temple. Are we reading this? Are we studying this? Because as Solomon built the temple, the saints of God, the children of God, the church of God, the people of God are building the church today, the temple. When we talk about the temple, on the one hand, there's a physical temple, which is a building, like this building in which we are now is a temple of God. On the other hand, there's the spiritual side, the church of the living God, the members of the church, the saints of God, the children of God, they are also the temple. And so you have the temple this side, the temple that side. As you come to the New Testament, we have that same understanding that the house of God, the temple of God, the habitation of God, the sanctuary of God, the place of worship, it's a real place to worship. It's a building, a physical building. Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6, we're looking at verses 3 and 4. Luke chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And Jesus answering them said, Have you not read so much as this? 
what David did when he himself was an ongard, and they which were well, with we'll him, look at verse 4, how, how he went into the house of God. That's a building. That's a physical building. A church building. He went to the house of God and did take and eat the showbread and gave also to them that were with him, which it is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. But as we talk about the house of God, we also talk about the habitation of God. That is, he dwells within his people. He lives within his people. So you understand, temple, physical, temple, spiritual. First Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? This is not a physical building now. You, the believers, you, the church, you, the saints of God, you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, that's temple again, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Tell me the rest. The temple ye yeah. are the people of God, the saints of God are the temple of God. So we're building the temple, the temple physical and the temple spiritual, the church of the living God. Chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Watch, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We're coming to First Timothy chapter 3. In First Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. First Timothy chapter 3. Here in verse 15 it says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. It refers to the house of God here, but he, he explains this house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. So there's the physical side to the church, there's the spiritual side to the church. Hebrews chapter 10 Reading from verse 19 to verse 21. Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Look at this. And having an high priest, tell me, over the house of God. Over the house of God. That's not talking about church building now. It's talking about the people of God. The house of God. The high priest over that house. Let us draw near. With a true heart. In full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled. From an evil conscience. And our bodies washed. With pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. Let us. When he says let us. He's talking about the house of God. He's talking about the habitation of God. He's talking about the people of God. And he says let us consider one another. To provoke unto love. And to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. As the manner of some is. Is, but exalting one another and so much the more as you see the days approaching Ephesians chapter 2 in Ephesians chapter 2 reading from verse 18 this makes it clear beyond any shadow of doubt when it talks about the house of God the habitation of God the temple of God the sanctuary of God actually the people of God Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 for through him, that is through the Lord Jesus Christ, we both have, have, have access to, by one spirit, unto the Father. There you see the Trinity right there. Through him, Jesus. We both have access. 
Jews and Gentiles, by one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, unto the Father, God the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. He's talking about believers now, fellow citizens with the saints of God and of the what? Household of God. The family of God, the people of God, and we and are built upon the foundation. He's talking about building our lives. Those who are saved, those who are children of God, because we become like living stones, and we and we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. Verse twenty one, in whom all the building fitly framed together, groweth. The building fitly framed together, groweth. Is that physical or spiritual? Is that the physical building with uh, blocks and stones or the people of God? People of God. Because the physical building does not grow. He's talking about the people of God now. He says in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto an holy temple. You see that? The people of God refer to unto an holy temple in the Lord. In whom ye also. He's talking about people. Ye also. He's talking about believers. Is ye also the saints of God are built together for an what? Habitation of God. House of God. Habitation of God. Sanctuary of God. Temple of God. The same thing. That now God will live and dwell in us. An habitation of God through the Spirit. You see then, we're talking about building the physical church. We're talking about building the spiritual church. Whatever saints do, Whatever the servants of God do, whatever we steal what's in the kingdom, whatever we do, we do wholeheartedly for God's glory. Building a place of worship or building the people who worship, building a sanctuary or building the saints of God, building the physical house of God or building the spiritual habitation of God, we work with all our heart. We give with all our hearts. We labor with all our hearts. We do everything sincerely. We do everything sacrificially. We do everything unreservedly. We do everything cheerfully. We are the building, the temple of God. And I pray that God will make you a part in the building of the church on both sides in Jesus' name. We are considering tonight the saints' commitment to building God's temple. The saints commitment to building God's temple. Three things to look at. Number one, the construction. Number two, the contribution. Number three, the consecration. Number one, the construction of the temple for his glory. The construction of the temple for his glory. Number two, the contribution for the temple of our God. The contribution for the temple of our God. Number three, the consecration of the temple for godliness. The consecration of the temple for godliness. Number one, tell me. Tell me with the voice of preachers. The construction of the temple for his glory. As we look at uh, what Solomon did, you will see that God initiated the plan of the building. It wasn't something that, you know, David, yes, it was in the heart of David, but you will see that God gave the plan to David. God was not only interested in the construction and the building of the temple. He gave the pattern of the building to David. And David passed that on to Solomon. The foundation was laid. The work continued without interruption for seven years until it was finished and perfected. 
That means then, uh, as we look at building, we're building uh, the central church, the headquarters church, and of course in your various groups, you're building uh, uh, the physical churches in the various groups. And in the various districts and locations of the church, we're also building, and we learn a lot from Solomon, a lot from David, and a lot from the people of Israel at this time. First Chronicles chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 10. First Chronicles chapter 28, we're reading from verse 10. And you will see here how the people committed themselves to building this temple. We're looking at uh, chapter 28, First Chronicles and verse, 20, verse 10. Take it now. For the Lord has chosen thee to build a house for, this, for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. That means whatever reasons you may have for not being qualified and not being able and not being ready and not being prepared, you cannot tender that before the Lord. It says, be strong and do it. Well, do it in Jesus' name. And look at verse 11. Then David gave to Solomon, his son, the pattern of the porch. Solomon was a wise man. His wisdom did not come into the drawing, into the architectural design of the building. Solomon was uh, a younger person, dynamic and active, and not only really active, but proactive. But all the same, uh, his ingenuity or wisdom did not come into the uh, planning uh, of how the temple will be. David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of the houses thereof, and of the treasuries thereof, and of the upper chambers thereof, and of the inner palace thereof, and of the place of the mercy seat. Uh, Solomon could have said, am I not going to use my own initiative? You give me every detail of this house, of this part, of this part, and of that part. Because this is what the Spirit of God revealed. Look at verse 12, and the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit. The pattern of all that he had by the Spirit. And all those details are there that he gave unto him. Look at verse 19. In verse 19 it says, All this, said David, the Lord, made me to understand a writing by his hand upon me. That is, Solomon, all this that I'm giving to you as to the construction of the temple, as to the size of the temple, as to the various dimensions of the temple, and as to the various descriptions of the temple, the Lord himself made me to understand in writing by his son upon me even all the works of this pattern. And David said to Solomon, his son, be strong. And of a good courage. And tell me, do it. If you say you are courageous, you are doing nothing, you don't have any courage. You know, some people say, I have all the courage in the world. And I'm asking them, what are you doing with that courage? Some people say, I'm strong. And I'm asking them, what are you doing with all the strength? Or some people say, I love the Lord with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind. And I'm asking them, what is the action? That will prove that you actually love the Lord. If you have courage, do something. If you are strong, do something. And if you have love, do something. It says be strong and of a good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Some people say, you know, I don't fear anything under the sun. I'm asking them, what are you doing with that boldness and fearlessness? It's not, it's not the talk of the mouth. It is what you do that actually shows that you are fearless and that you are bold. And it says, for the Lord God, even my God, will be with you. I thought you'd say, Amen. Amen. He will not fail thee, Amen. nor forsake thee. But tell me what follows. Tell me out loud. Until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. You see, you cannot just claim the promise of God in isolation. God loves me. That's not in isolation. 
And God is going to protect me. That's not in isolation. And God is going to do good in my life. That's not in isolation. The, here the father was telling the son, he said, the Lord will not fail thee. Yes, that's true. Don't take that in isolation. And the Lord is not going to disappoint you or not forsake you. Don't take that in isolation. Solomon, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. And so as we look at the promises of God, we take those promises to mean that the Lord wants to energize us, empower us, equip us, so that we will do everything he has called us to do. In the case of Solomon now, you see Solomon could not just sit on the throne and be doing administration alone. Solomon could not sit on the throne and only be teaching the word of God alone. Solomon could not sit on the throne and just be writing the book of Proverbs alone, there was something God gave him to do. And you will do this and do this and do that, but this particular thing of building the temple, yeah, David wanted to build the temple, but God said, no, you are not going to build the temple. I've committed that to the hand of Solomon. And my brother, my sister, if you do every other thing and you do them well, you do them perfectly, you do them profitably, and everybody is talking about that. If you don't do this other one, which God has said you must do this and I'm staying by you and I'm standing by you and I'm giving you my promises for this reason until you finish the work of the house of the Lord. If you don't do that then you cannot claim that you are the perfect at the center of the will of God. We're going to do the will of God. You will do the will of God and you will build this temple in Jesus name. First Kings, I'm reading from chapter 6. First Kings, chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 12. First Kings, chapter 6, we're reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, concerning this house which thou art in building, if thou wilt walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then will I perform my words unto thee, which I speak unto David thy father, and I will dwell among the children of Israel. You know what the Lord was saying? The Lord was saying, yes, all my promises that I'm going to be in the midst of the children of Israel, I'm going to fulfill, but you know it's based on building this sanctuary for me. It's, it's based on building this temple for me. Then he goes on to say, I will not forsake my people Israel. So, verse 14, everybody one, two, three, go. So Solomon built the house and tell me, and tell me out aloud, and finished it. You know, there are people that have unfinished projects. They build, they are building, they are building, they are building, and then something else takes their attention and diverts their attention. And the thing is there, and they cannot finish. Whatever God has made us to start, we're going to finish. The cost to finish, God will bring it out from us. We're going to finish. And whatever we need to do, and whatever plans we need to have, and whatever gadgets we need to bring in, every little detail of that headquarters building, we're going to finish in Jesus' name. Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 8, and we're reading from verse 16. Second Chronicles chapter 8. And we're reading here from verse 16. Here in verse 16, now all the work of Solomon was prepared unto the day of the foundation of the house for the of the Lord. Uh, what the passage here is saying is that all the things they would need. They had, uh, they had planned ahead. And they have seen where this will be, where that will be, where that will be. They have seen all the treasures that will be brought in. The stones that were brought in. The wood that will be brought in. And the iron that will be brought in. And then the pavement and all the things. Everything they needed so that that building will be what it ought to be. It says now, all the work of Solomon was prepared unto the day of the foundation of the house of the Lord until until I love this word and I pray that your life you will not stop until you finish 
everything you have started you'll not stop until you finish you know if you look at many lives many lives they, they have this a plan and this good project they start and they are very passionate about it and then when they run for some time all the steam is gone all the passion is gone all the zeal is gone and then they cannot continue and then they, they, another day maybe a message comes and then they pick up another thing and they say this one I'm going to run with this one they run and run and run and then before they get to the end they, they, are, they quench they, they are out and they, they are quenched I, I pray that will not happen to you again and that, for, that means you are going to repent you are going to say Lord I lay my life on the altar this habit of starting and not finishing starting and not finishing and then I consecrate I make vows and I, I get started I don't finish oh Lord take this away from me and you will continue till the very end in Jesus name I'm going to read that verse again now all the work of Solomon was prepared unto the day of the foundation of the house of the Lord and and uh, until it was finished then you read the last sentence there verse 16 1 2 3 go so the house of the Lord was perfected read that again now we're not going to read that in isolation Bagada is going to be perfected headquarters church of deeper life is the headquarters of the whole of deeper life all over the world and is going to be perfected in jesus name your hand will be part of the hand that will perfect it your contribution will perfect it your participation will perfect it it says so the house of the lord was perfected well how did he do that what was the mind of the people that did that? Let me show you Psalm 132. Psalm 132. In Psalm 132, you see the attitude of the people. When people want to work for God, and they make up their minds that we have started this, God gave this plan, God gave this instruction, and God gave this pattern, and we have committed ourselves to it, and it's going to be done. See the attitude of the people, the action of the people, that gets started, they continue until they finish. We're looking at Psalm 132. I'm reading from verse 1. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swear unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. This is what David did. This is how he set his mind. And this is how he, he kind of made himself committed to the work of the building. He said, surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes, nor slumber to my eyelids. Tell me what follows until 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 i find out a place for the lord and habitation for the mighty god of jacob you see how they set their minds to do what they ought to do and there are people they know that you know the headquarters church is going on well they just say when are they going to finish when are they going to finish we're saying when are you going to make up your mind to get to be part of it until it is finished and thank god today you are standing to your responsibility and you are standing to your duty. It will be done in Jesus' name. Now, uh, that's, the that's the attitude of David. Uh, let's see what he passed on, what he passed on to Solomon. And let's see what you are to pass on to members of the church, to your own sons and daughters in the faith, and to the people. Like Solomon was a son to uh, David, you are the father now, you are the mother now, and then you have sons in the Lord. You have taken your stand like David. You are saying, I'm not going to raise everything that needs to be done, everything that needs to be contributed until that place is finished and perfected I'm going to be like David I commit myself to it beyond that you're not going to talk to your own son you're going to talk to your own daughters we're looking at uh, first Chronicles chapter 22 first Chronicles chapter 22 we're reading from verse 19 first Chronicles chapter 22 verse 19 and let me back up to verse 17 uh, david also commanded all the princes of israel 
to help Solomon, his son. And this is not a private thing that, you know, I, I'm committed to this and I'm going to uh, see that whatever contribution I can make, I will make. But David, after committing himself, and he said, I will not give myself any rest, and I'm not going to go and rest in my own personal house until I see that there's a place of habitation for the Almighty God. He now commanded all the princes of Israel to help Solomon, his son, saying, It's not the Lord your God with you. And I see not giving you rest on every side, for he has given the inhabitants of the land into mine hand. That is at all those battles and wars, and he won them, and the hand, and the land is subdued before the Lord and before his people. Verse 19, look at verse 19. Verse 19, everybody, look at this. Don't read, but I'll read for you. It says, Now set your heart. And your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise therefore and build ye the sanctuary of the Lord God to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and of the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built that is to be built to the name of the Lord. He said, I have made my vow. He said, I've made my commitment. He said, I'm not going to rest. I'm not going to just sit somewhere and be looking at the work and think that other people are going to do it. I will not rest until this work is done. And now he turned to all the elders and all the leaders and all the princes of Israel. He said, don't leave Solomon alone to this. Yes, God has committed this to his hand as the leader, as the king. But everybody you're riding around and set your heart and and set your soul to seek the Lord your God and arise therefore and build. We're going to do that in Jesus' name. And uh, they so contributed. Look at 2 uh, Chronicles chapter 24. Second Chronicles chapter 24. We're reading from verse 14. Second Chronicles chapter 24 verse 14. And when they had finished it, they finished, we're going to finish. I said we're going to finish. Amen. And thank God you'll still be alive. Amen. I said you will be alive. Amen. And you will worship in that place. Amen. Your converts will be there. Amen. Your sons and your daughters will be there. Amen. And the joy of the Lord will multiply the church of God in Jesus name. Look at verse 14. And when they had finished it, they brought the rest of the money. Before the king, they brought the rest of the money before the king and, and Jehoiada. Whereof were made vessels, whereof were made vessels for the house of the Lord, even vessels to minister and to offer with her and spoons and vessels of gold and silver. And they offered burnt offerings to the house of the Lord continually, 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 all the days of Jehoiada. This is another generation, and he's saying that at this time, when they needed money. They got all the money they needed to finish what they needed to do and then they had extra. And they didn't return the extra to the people that contributed. They said, look at this. We need vessels here. We need instruments here. We need tools here. We need this here. Although the money was contributed for the building, we're going to use this extra to buy every other thing we need. You know, the building is going to be there by the grace of God and it's going to be finished. And if it is like uh, we are seeing the vision and we are seeing the reality before the end of this year, I mean before the very last day of this year you should be at Bagara to worship there and then, but you understand, we need more buses, we need instruments of music, we need this, we need this and all the contributions we are going to be making will cover that and even go beyond in Jesus name you see, that's what he did. And the purpose is so that the people will be able to, in the Old Testament, they'll sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they'll make atonement. In the Old Testament, the priests will teach them, the Levites will teach them how to receive pardon and cleansing. There'll be the reading of the word of God.
God. Hearing the word of God. There will be worship. There will be readiness and preparation for the heavenly sanctuary. That's the reason why they were there. And that's the reason why they were building what they were building. And today is the same reason we're building. So that we can provide a place of worship for the people who are heavenly minded. They want to go to heaven. And as we build the church building, physical church building, you know, then it will help them to get ready and to get prepared to be in that heavenly city eventually in Jesus' name. We're looking at First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 1. First Peter chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 1. It says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking as newborn babes, Desire the sincere milk of the word that she may grow thereby. What do we do that? And where do we teach the sincere milk of the word of God so that the converts will grow, the disciples will grow, the members will grow? It's in the church building. And it goes on to say, If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious to whom I'm coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house. You see, we build the physical house to make the lively stones moving and walking and coming to that physical house to be built up. Do you understand? It's like you are a temple within the temple. You are the spiritual temple in the inside, the physical temple. But we need to build the physical temple so there will be roof on us. So that when the rain is coming down, the rain will not disturb our worship. And then there are the walls, there will be everything. And all the gadgets we need, everything will be there. It's not just where we are the spiritual temple and that's enough. Yes, the spiritual temple has to be in the physical temple. That's why it says in verse 5, He also has lively stones and built up a up a spiritual house a holy and holy priesthood to offer all spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god by jesus christ look at verse 9 but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into is marvelous light. We're coming to point number two. Point number two, the contribution for the temple of our God. The contribution for the temple of our God. You see the way the uh, David and the way Solomon and the princes of, uh, of Israel, the way they took this, everybody took it personal. It's not like, you know, uh, the other person will do it. Have you heard before, everybody's business is nobody's business. Or well, you're thinking, the others will do it. The others will contribute. Uh, they are also thinking, the others will contribute. And therefore, they are folding your ha their hands. And you are folding your hands and nothing comes to you. Know? But uh, look at the attitude of uh, David and the attitude of uh, Solomon. And the attitude of uh, the princes in Israel. And of all the people in Israel. We're coming to First Kings chapter 5. First Kings chapter 5. Uh, I'm reading from verse 5. And here you are going to look at the personal pronoun. You are going to look at the word I. I. Look at this. First Kings chapter 5. What's the verse? Verse 5. Chapter 5 verse 5. And behold. What's it? I purpose to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God. Personal. Personal. I make my commitment and I'm going to contribute to the very extent of my possession because I'm not going to depend on other people doing it. If everybody will think like that and everybody will say what David said, everybody will say what Solomon said and the, each person will say, I purpose to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God as the Lord Speak unto David my father, saying, Thy son, 
whom I will set upon thy throne in thy room. He shall build an house unto my name. If everybody will take that a stand, like a Solomon took, like David took, I believe that uh, before long, everything will be all right. And I thank God everything is going to be finished. But coming back to this, Psalm 132 again, I'll show you the reason why. Psalm 132, and I'm reading from verse 1. We'll see that David, as I said, I purpose to build a house for the Lord. I purpose, personal. Uh, let's come to chapter 132 of the Psalms. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swear unto the Lord and how he vouch unto the mighty God of Jacob. Surely, tell me, I personal. You see, uh, that's how the people regarded the work of the Lord. It's not like, you know, in these days when people are, they transfer responsibility to other people. They transfer duty to other people. They transfer the giving to other people. Oh, there are other people there. They will give. No, they didn't do that. Surely I will not come into my tabernacle, the thunder of my house, nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes nor or slumber to mine eyelids until I find a place for the Lord an habitation for the mighty God of Jacob you see it mentioned vow in verse 2 it said I swear unto the Lord and I vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob let's see what he said about the vow in Psalm 116 Psalm 116, reading from verse 14. In verse 14, this is David now, he says, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. He vowed his war and he said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. There's not going to be a secret thing. I'm going to pay my vow in the presence of all these people. Look at verse 16. O Lord, truly, thou, truly, I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. Look at verse 18. I will pay my vows unto the Lord when... When are you going to pay your vow? Now, in the presence of all his people. Let's see how he did that. First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29. You know, it's wonderful when somebody says, I'm going to do something, and the very next day, you see him doing it. Not the people that said, I will. One week has passed, I will. One month has passed, I will. One year has passed and they're doing nothing. But it's a beautiful thing, a wonderful thing. It's a character that is solid. It's a character that is dependable. When somebody says, I swore to the Lord, I made a vow to the Lord, and I'm going to pay my vow, and then in the next day or the next week, you see him doing that. Let's look at First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 1. Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregations, Solomon my son, whom alone God has chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great for the palace, is not for man, but, tell me, for the Lord God. Look at verse 2. Now, I have prepared with all my might. I have prepared. Uh, this is not just somebody taking an extra beach that he doesn't need. This is not uh, somebody taking a little change that he doesn't need this one. He can easily throw this away and he wouldn't feel it at all. He said, no, I have prepared with all my might for the house of of my God, the gold for the things of, uh, to made of gold, and the silver for the things of silver, and the brass for the things of uh, for brass, and the iron for the things of iron. Very thoughtful 
I'm very detailed. He knows that this will be needed. He provided. That will be needed. He provided. And wood for the things of wood. Only stones and stones to be set. Glistering stones. And of diverse colors. All manner of precious stones. And marble. And stones in abundance. Moreover, because I have set my affection. He told the princes of Israel, set your affection, set your heart, set your soul on building this temple. What he told them, he himself did. He said, because I've set my affection to the house of my God, I have of mine own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. That's a good example. I said that's a good example. I said that's a good example. And you are going to also show that example. Did you hear that? Amen. We we'll show it in Jesus name. The Lord is depending on you. And the Lord is trusting you that you will do. You, you see, these Old Testament people, these Old Testament people, and see what they did, and see their commitment, and see the contribution they made. Uh, let's look at chapter 22. We're looking at First Chronicles chapter 22, verse 5. First Chronicles chapter 22, verse 5. And David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender, and the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceeding magnificent must be exceeding magnificent. He said this is not going to be a small thing. It was building for the king of kings and the lord of lords and he says uh, it must be of fame and of glory throughout all countries. It must be of fame and of glory throughout all countries. What we are saying is the headquarters church of Deeper Life Bagada is going to be a reference point. And all over this land, it will be a reference point. And all over Nigeria, it will be a reference point. All over Africa, it will be a reference point. And you will say, praise the Lord, that's my church. Amen. I said, that's your church. Amen. But look at the consequence now. Look at what he said at the latter part of that verse 5. I will therefore, because it's going to be a point of reference, and because it's going to be magnificent, because it's going to be of fame, because it's going to be of glory, throughout all countries, because of that, because it's not going to be a small thing, I will therefore now make preparation for it. I will therefore, because of that, because of the size, and because of the nature, and because it's going to bring multitudes into the kingdom of God, I will therefore make preparation for it. So, David, tell me. So, David, tell me. Prepared abundantly before his death. Look at the attitude of this man. He knew he was about to die. He knew that he would not even continue to see the glory of that building. And yet, and yet, because of his love for God, he said, even though I'm not going to live long to see it, yet I'm going to make all the preparations. And he made all the preparations. And, but you are not like that. And the way I look at you, you still have a decades and decades and decades still to live. And, uh, you know, the life of God in you is still bubbling and, you know, you are still ready to run. And by the grace of God, since you are partakers of this and you are part of this, and you are going to be preachers there. You are going to be leaders there. And you are going to be the people that will bring thousands and millions of souls into the kingdom over there through your ministry. Your hand must be in this. Your contribution must be in this. David said so. He prepared abundantly before his death. Let, let's come to chapter 22 of 1 Chronicles verse 14. 1 Chronicles chapter 22 verse 14. Now behold, in my trouble I have prepared for the house of the Lord and hundred thousand talents of gold. You know, uh, they were not measuring this one by tens or hundreds, thousands, thousands. And then it says, a thousand, thousand talents of silver and of brass and of iron without which 
Even, you know, Solomon or David, when he said, how, do, how much does this weigh? How much does this weigh? Eventually, he said, forget about the weight. And then when he said, how much is this? He said, forget about how much. He just gave and gave and gave. That's why the Lord blessed them. And that's how the place was finished. And then he goes on to say, without number, for it is in abundance timber. For it is an abundance timber also, and stone have I prepared that, and thou mayest add thereto, and thou mayest add thereto. Don't say because I've given much, I've given much, then you fold your hand, you must add thereto. Your contribution will be there. Amen. Am I talking to anybody here today? I said your contribution will be there. Uh, look at verse 15. Moreover, there are workmen with thee in abundance. All the people that David could influence, workmen, he influenced them. And then he says, he was and workers of stone and timber and all manner of cunning men for every manner of work and of gold. And, and the silver and the brass and the iron there is no number arise therefore and be doing and the Lord will be with thee the Lord will be with thee I'm asking a question now. How did, how did David get into all this? How did Solomon get into all this? What example did they have before them? You see, it's good to, to climb on the shoulders of the people before you. You see, there are people, they don't understand life. People don't understand how we make progress in life. Somebody is in front of you. And there are many people, they'll stand behind the person uh, in front of them. And they, you'll not see them. You don't see their picture. You don't see their figure because they are standing behind. But what we do in leadership, you look at the leader before you and you stand on their shoulders so that you will see farther than you can see. And you will go farther than I can go. And you will have further vision than they ever had. Look at leaders before you, the people that impress you and the people that do things that you say, I wish I were like that. Well, don't just stand at their back, climb on their shoulders. What that means is study what they have done, see what they have done, and look at what they have done, analyze what they have done, stand on their shoulders, and look beyond, and you do more in Jesus' name. You see, you see what had happened is this, in the Old Testament, before David, before David now started making vow and making consecration, I'm going to do this, there was something before him. Look at chapter 15. Chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 1, Exodus, Exodus. Exodus chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 2. Exodus chapter 15, verse 2. Are you there? Exodus 15, what verse? I'm waiting for you. Exodus chapter 15, verse 2. The Lord is my strength and song. Amen. Amen. And it's become my salvation. Amen. Amen. He is my God. And I will tell me. Prepare him an habitation. My father's God, I will exalt him. Here is, you know, what Moses and the children of Israel, what they had sung and what they had said even before the time of David. And David could see that. He said, the people that went before me, they made a personal decision and a personal vow. And they said, I will prepare prepare an habitation for him my father's god i will exalt him and then david would have seen how they did it at that time look at chapter 36 exodus chapter 36 i'm reading from verse 5 exodus chapter 36 and we're looking at verse uh, what at verse verse 5 exodus chapter 36 verse 5 and he speak unto Moses, saying, The people bring, tell me, much more than enough. The people bring much more than enough. Here is the example David had seen. 
Here is the example because you understand the kings of Israel, they were to read the book of the law and they were to set that before them and read that every day and learn that every day so that they will follow the Lord the way it has been stipulated or written down in the book of the law. And David addressed this one and he said when they were going to build that tabernacle in the wilderness, everybody made up their minds and it was a personal thing. I will build an habitation for the Lord my God. And when they did, it says the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses said, gave commandment and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp saying let neither man nor woman neither man nor tell me neither man nor tell me the people that brought the offering that brought the gifts were they men only were they women only men and women but now they said let neither man or woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary so the people were restrained from bringing for the stuff the arch was sufficient for all the work to make it and and uh, uh, are you there and uh, too much you see, that's the example that uh, David had seen. That's why I said, when you are coming behind a leader, Moses had gone. The children of Israel had gone, but the record was still there. And so, you will climb on their shoulders and say, this is how they did it. And this is why God blessed them. And this is why those people were unconquerable. If you want to be unconquerable, you follow the people that have come before you and see the way they did it and you will never lack in your life. Spiritually, you will not lack. Professionally, you will not lack. And the works of your heart will prosper beyond your expectation in Jesus' name. And so they had that to follow. Now let's see in uh, Second Chronicles now, chapter two. Second Chronicles, chapter two. Second Chronicles, chapter two. And we're reading from verse one. Second Chronicles, chapter two. We're reading from verse one. I'm waiting for you to open your Bible. Second Chronicles, chapter two, verse one. We're going to read the first line together. One, two, three, go. And Solomon determined to build a house for the name of the Lord and a house for his kingdom. He determined. He determined. He said, come what may, this one will be done. He determined whatever the cost, whatever the cost. I've seen what my father David has done, uh, old man, and he's about to go. And I'm still young. I've seen what Moses did in the wilderness. I've seen what those Israelites did. Now this will be done. You will determine. I said you will determine that at this time, this year now, this is not, it is not a, a project for another seven years now. This is a project we're finishing uh, before December. Yeah. And it's going to be perfected before December. Yeah. And as Solomon determined, you determine. Yeah. If you're going to sell your land, you will sell your land. Yeah. Give me a good, good day. Amen. Yeah. Because if you sell your land after all, the Lord is going to provide a larger land for you in Jesus' name. If you're going to sell your house, you will sell your house. And if you, that's determination. That's a person that says, whatever this will cost, this one, this time will be done. And so you determine like they determine. And the Lord, you see how the Lord blessed uh, Solomon as he determined to build. Did Solomon become poorer? No, he became richer, the richest in the community, in the country at that time. And Solomon determined to build a house for the name of the Lord and a house for his kingdom. We're reading from verse 4. Look at verse 4. Behold, I build a house to the name of the Lord my God to dedicate it to him and to burn before him sweet incense. 
and for the continual showbread and for burnt offerings morning and evening on, on the Sabbaths and on the new moons and all this, all the solemn feasts of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance forever for Israel. Look at verse 5. And the house which I built, tell me. The house which I built, tell me out loud. Is great for great is our God above all gods. He said, I'm not going to do some ramshackle thing. I'm, going to, I'm not going to do some little thing there. We're building for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's a great God. He's a God who is above all gods. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, even to prepare me timber in abundance for the house which I am about to build shall be wonderful great shall be wonderful great welcome to second chronicles chapter 31 second chronicles chapter 31 and i'm reading from verse 5 second chronicles chapter 31 we're looking at verse 5. You see the examples of these people. They saw the people before them. David saw Moses and Israel before him. And uh, Solomon saw David before him. And now these people we're going to read about. They had seen David and Solomon before them. Look at chapter 31 verse 5. He appointed also the king's portion of his substance for the burnt offering to which... For the morning and evening burnt offerings and burnt offerings of the Sabbaths for the new moons and for the set feasts as it is written in the law of God. Sorry, that's verse 3. I'm looking for verse 5. That's, it's good to give you extra. More than, more than I thought I would give to you. Now that you've got the extra, let's look at verse 5. Verse 5, and as soon as the commandment came abroad, and the children of Israel brought, tell me, in abundance the first fruits of corn, wine, oil, and honey, and of all the increase of the field, and the tithe of all things brought day in how abundantly. And concerning the children of Israel and Judah, that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they also brought in a tithe of oxen and sheep and a tithe of holy things which were consecrated unto the Lord their God and laid them by heaps. In the third month, they began to lay the foundation of, heap, of the heaps and finished them in the seventh month. And when Ezekiah and the princes came and saw the heaps. They blessed the Lord and his people Israel. Then Ezekiah questioned the, the priests and the Levites concerning the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we have had, we have had enough to eat and have, le and have left, and have left plenty for the Lord has blessed his people. And that which is left is this great store. So you'll see how they looked at what the people before them had done and they did much more. And we are looking at what the people before us have done. Watch how Solomon built the temple. And we are building this one. By the grace of God, we are going to perfect it in Jesus' name. The contribution was more than sufficient to build, to finish, and to perfect the temple of God. In fact, there's something surprising. Let me look at this. Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 1. This is surprising. Ezra chapter 1. Are you there? Ezra chapter 1. I said, are you there? Yes. Verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord, that the word of the Lord, by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, 
king of Persia. Think about that. This is a heathen king. This is a king that wasn't part of the children of Israel. And the Lord stirred up his spirit that he made a proclamation throughout all this kingdom. And put it also in writing saying, Thus say Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He realized that it was the king, it was the God of heaven that gave him all this position, all this privilege. And then he said, and he has charged me to build him a house where? At Jerusalem, which is in Judea. It is not only the people in Lagos here building the headquarters, all of us together. You are in uh, you know, any stage in Nigeria here. Look at Cyrus, far, far away. He said, The Lord has charged me, He stirred me up that I should build a house in Jerusalem. And all of us, uh, countries of Africa and countries beyond Africa, in Europe, in America, Asia, everywhere, you are hearing this. This is what the Lord has charged every one of us. And if this Cyrus obeyed the Lord you are going to obey the Lord I said you are going to obey the Lord and then you know Cyrus now challenged him look at verse 3 who is there among you of all these people is God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem which is in Judah and build the house of the Lord God of Israel he is the God which is in Jerusalem and also remaineth in any place. This is not Jerusalem now, where he sojourneth. Let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with bees beside the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. You see how they did it at that time. And thank God, these things are written, for example, upon whom the ends of the world are come, that we will follow the same thing. And we are going to follow. And we are going to do it. The joy of serving the Lord, the joy of obeying the Lord, of saying, they did it at that time. And the grace of God is abundant today. We are going to do it at this time in Jesus' name. Point number three now, the consecration of the temple for godliness the consecration of the temple for godliness when the temple is finished what use do we make of the temple the consecration of the temple for godliness you understand the palace of the king is only for the king the palace of the king is always for the king and the palace of the king is ever forever for the king the same thing the house of god the sanctuary of god the temple of god is only and always and ever for god it's not a commercial center it's not a place of a merchandise it's to teach the word of god is to worship the Lord, is to pray to the Lord, is to hear his word, is to learn his word, is to show how to love him, how to serve him, and how to obey him, is to live for him here on earth, so that we will go to live with him in heaven. And you will get there. Micah chapter 4. Micah chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 2. Micah chapter 4 verse 2. The purpose of the house of God. The purpose of the temple of God. And what we are going to commit and consecrate that house of God to. Look at uh, chapter 4 of Micah verse 2. And many nations shall come and say, come. And let us go up to the mount, to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways. That's what we'll consecrate the house for. And we will walk in his paths. For the Lord shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And you know that when Jesus Christ came, that's what you saw about the consecration of the temple, the consecration of the house of the Lord. We're coming to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. And so when we build a sanctuary, when we build the house of God, when we build the temple of God, this is the use, this is what we're consecrated to. 
what we're devoted to and ever forever every time and it is not that you know today we're selling rice there tomorrow we're selling corn and to another day we're saying no it's not for commands it's not for commands it's for the worship of god we're looking at uh, luke chapter 19 uh, verse 45 luke chapter 19 verse 45 uh, and he referring to jesus and he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought saying unto them it is written it is written my house is the house of what of prayer is to go there and to pray it's to go there and to meet our needs, spiritual needs. It's to go there and to pray for salvation and pray for sanctification and pray for the Holy Ghost baptism and pray for miracle and pray for the dew of heaven, the refreshing of heaven to come upon our soul. It says, my house is the house of prayer, but she have made it a den of thieves. Look at verse 47. 47. And it touched how? Where? That's the reason the temple is there. He taught daily in the temple. He taught daily in the temple. Daily he taught. Look at chapter 20 verse 1. Chapter 20. Luke chapter 20 verse 1. And it came to pass that on one of those days as he taught the people where? In the temple. It taught the people in the temple. That's what to consecrate the temple for. Look at verse 2. And speak unto and speak unto him, saying, Tell us by what authority doest thou these things, or who gave thee this authority? We're coming to chapter 21. Chapter 21. And I'm reading from verse 33. So, uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 33. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but, tell me, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That word remains. And so, where do we teach that word? We're coming to verse 38. And all the people came early in the morning to him, where? In the temple for for to hear him in the temple for to hear him that's what the temple is for that's what the house of god is for john chapter 7 john chapter 7 verse 14 john chapter 7 verse 14 now about the midst of the feast jesus went where did he go into the temple and taught you see that consistently we consecrate the temple to the preaching to the teaching of the word of god we're looking at chapter 8 of john john chapter 8 verse 2 john chapter 8 verse 2 and early in the morning he came again where did he come into the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and uh, touched them look at verse 20 these words speak jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple as he taught in the temple and so you understand when we build a sanctuary for the lord house for the lord and we build the temple of the lord it is to teach the word of acts of the apostles acts of the apostles we're reading from chapter 5 acts chapter 5 we're reading from verse 19 but the angel of the lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said go stand and speak where in the temple to the people all the words of this life the whole gospel the full gospel the entire gospel and teach the people in the temple all the words of this life look at verse 21 and when they had that they entered into the temple into the temple and early in the morning and taught they, they entered into the temple early in the morning and told, look at verse 25. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing where? In the temple. What were they doing? 
teaching the people, teaching the people. They didn't uh, limit uh, the teaching of the people to only Saturday or Sunday. Consistently, daily, they were teaching them. Look at chapter 5, verse 42. Chapter 5, verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house. You see, they made use of the temple every day. And they made use of the various houses as fellowships every day. And our local churches are still there. We're still going to be teaching the word of God. Our the group churches are still there. We're still going to be teaching the word of God here and there, there and here. The word of God will saturate the whole land in Jesus' name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. We're coming to Ephesians now. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20, verses 21 and 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. In whom all the building fitly framed together grows into an holy temple in the Lord. As we make use of the temple physical to teach, to lead, to train, to transform, then the people of God who are the temple of God will grow into an holy temple. In whom ye also, you are part of this. I said you are part of this. In whom ye also are built together an habitation of God through the Spirit. And so from what we have learned, the temple of God is entirely, completely, unreservedly, uninterruptedly, consecrated to God. Number one, for the teaching of the gospel. For the teaching of the gospel. Number two, for turning sinners to God. Sinners will come from all over and they will turn to the Lord in Jesus' name. Number three is for learning to pray unto God. We pray to God and God will answer our prayers. Number four, it we tarrying before God for the promised Christian experiences. It's in the temple. As people come, they get saved. As people come, they have the abundance of the grace of God in them. As people come, they get sanctified. They get filled with the Holy Ghost. They have Christian experiences. And then number five, for training, for preaching, to spread the gospel. That's why we're at the temple. We're able to, like we're here now, for example, we're gathered here and training is possible. If there was no building like this and you know, you are there and there and all that, the training will not be as easy as it is today. Number six, it is for constant renewal and growth in grace. That is when the temple is there and the people of God come together, we make use of that opportunity for growth in grace. And it is to watch at the gate of heaven so we can be ready to enter heaven. The temple, the house of God is the gate of heaven. And we come to that gate to learn, to receive, and to pray, and to prepare so that we'll be ready for the glory of heaven. We're at the gate, we'll receive everything we need to have, and then we're at the glory eventually. Come to Genesis, Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28, we're reading from verse 16. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely, the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. Look at this. And he was afraid. And said, how dreadful is this place. This is none other but, what? The house of God. And this is, tell me, the gate of heaven. There's no other place in the whole world. No other place in the nation. No other place in the country. No other place in the city that can refer to as the gate of heaven is the church building. Where people come, they hear the word of salvation, and then they are saved. They hear the word of holiness. They are made holy, made ready for the rapture. That is the gate of heaven. And what we're saying is the Lord has given us the charge that there'll be the construction of the temple. There'll be contribution 
towards that temple and will consecrate that temple to preparing people to get to heaven. Thank God you are here tonight. And thank God you are part of this. This is one of the greatest things you can ever do in your life. To make total contribution. Everything you've got to make sure that this gate of heaven is ready to prepare people for the glory of heaven. You will do it. I will do it. We will do it together. And the goal of the Lord will be realized in Jesus' name. Rise up and let's talk to the Lord in prayer. You see how Solomon determined and you see how, you've seen how David made a vow and committed himself to that. The Lord wants us to do that. You'll do it. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. You are not going to be stingy. You're not going to hold anything back. This is the time to bring everything you've got into what the Lord is about to do. And you're going to be part of this. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord, tell the Lord that you're going to do it. Tell the Lord that you're going to do it. You commit yourself completely, completely. Pray now. Open your mouth. Tell the Lord. And commit yourself and commit your substance and commit everything you've got to making sure that this temple is built to the glory of God and to perfection. <laughs>